to the Zimbabwean publication The Standard. Last year, the country attracted foreign direct investment of about $545 million. That's US dollars. It's the highest it's received since dollarization in 2009. Now, Zimbabwe seems adamant to remove the licenses of companies that have not yet complied uh, with its indigenization requirements, including some noteworthy South African businesses. This is The Money Makers. I am Bruce Whitfield, and tonight I'm talking to Joseph Boucher. He's with J.M. Boucher Investments about what it will cost Zimbabwe's economy to have these companies to comply and how much is at risk for the Zimbabwean government itself by insisting on stringent and controversial steps if these companies do not comply. Some of South Africa's most prominent resource firms are in the firing line. Joseph Busher, Zimbabwe, nice, the yeah. new indigenization minister, indigenization youth and culture or something like that, wants to make his mark. There are companies which are operating with impunity in Zimbabwe, which are not complying with local legislation and seemingly show no intention to do so. And he's wanting to pull rank on them. Well, certainly the laws haven't been applied uh, consistently and equally so for a very long term. We know some of the companies, you know, instead of getting uh, 49 and the government getting 51, some companies basically got the dispensation possibly to get about 51 or above that. Uh, you know, what the Zimbabwean government and obviously some of these young uh, enthusiastic, if I may call them, ministers don't understand is that the world does not work like that. So investors want to put money where it is certain that the laws and the rules will not change willy-nilly. Um, and certainly it won't help Zimbabwe any time in the near future. But the, the rules are pretty clear, though, isn't it? I mean, there's indigenization policy. 51% uh, goes into the hands of the state. Is it into the hands of the state, or can it be in the hands of private individuals who are Zimbabwean nationals? Well, that's quite uh, also debatable in terms of, uh, you know, which, which nationals. Remember what I said earlier is that certain companies have managed to get a 51% uh, where they got a special uh, dispensation. When Finance Minister uh, Patrick Sinamasa came through, they tried to say, well, we'll look at it on a case-by-case -case basis when they realized that nobody was coming through. But obviously, recently, we've just seen, obviously, companies uh, w in the diamond sector within the Chiaza Diamonds, basically, where their license were not renewed, but possibly for not renewal and also not complying with the laws. But, you know, for me, the key issue is really we need to know and understand is that what does it help Zimbabwe, some of these things. In unemployment is high, people basically are still starving, and certainly there's no cash flows uh, in, in Zimbabwe. So I think what the government needs to do is to make sure that when they apply the laws, they are consistent throughout all the different sectors, and it mm. does not have any gray matters around. Now, okay, so the indigenization law as it stands at the moment, just summarize it for me. I mean, the, the BE codes are massively complicated. Yeah. I'm sure that the indigenization laws of Zimbabwe are equally complicated to outsiders. Just give me a sense of what they're trying to achieve. It's transformation of an economy that is still much like South Africa, dominated by predominantly white-owned or white-controlled conglomerates. Necessary, uh, Bruce. Uh, let me give you, uh, you know, a little bit of um, uh, some history mm. here. So we had more than 26 banks in Zimbabwe, okay, of which half of them were owned by indigenous people. Uh, in other words, African Zimbabweans in Zimbabwe. Um, so you had your normal Stan Big, Stan Chattered, and Barclays that were operating mm. in Zimbabwe, and those companies all of them were closed down. Uh, so certainly within the financial service sector at that stage, you did not need to apply any indigenization because already you had massive participation by office locals within the banks. When Stan Chart started closing some of their branches, they were bought by First Bank, uh, obviously which was also owned by politically connected people. Um, you know, they just bought took over in terms mm -hmm. of their branches and networks. So we can leave that sector to say this is basically what happened. Uh, and then we can go in terms of the manufacturing sector. You know, we had companies that were doing well. Obviously, some of them relocated in, uh, to South Africa, like Coca-Cola. They used to have their head office in Zimbabwe. Um, so those things obviously didn't work out. And when we didn't have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, high inflation, uh, you know, one million percent and so on, most of those guys relocated to, 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 to South Africa. Now, the laws in Zimbabwe might appear is simpler, uh, certainly, in the sense that they just say 51% must go to, to the locals, okay? Now, the question is, it, who is local? 
um, uh, do I qualify as local even if I'm Zimbabwean or is the state? And, and I think is that gray A to say who makes that composition of the local that could be a problem? At, at the same time, there is a law in place and yes. we can argue about the technicalities of the law, yeah. but there are a bunch of South African companies operating in Zimbabwe who for whatever reason, are not compliant with, with local re legislation. Now, surely if you choose to operate in a geographical area, you choose to operate in that area based on the laws of those countries. I agree with you 100%. And I think we've seen that with the MTN uh, in Nigeria, for example, where there were certain things in black and white and they chose not to comply. Um, so in the Zimbabwe case, uh, there is, uh, we, let's talk about the mining sector, say, for example, you know, we've got Zimplas, uh, which is owned by Impala, um, and uh, some few other, you know, mining uh, companies in, 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 you know, in Zimbabwe owned by South Africans. So it, it is quite clear one of the key issues they've been talking about obviously is beneficiation okay and basically the other policy which is the zim asset in, which is really just a continuation uh, of, of uh, in, in making sure that they implement the be or the indigenization policies they call it in Zimbabwe. Now, there has been a debate in terms of uh, beneficiation, in particular, smeltering, you know, because, you know, if we mine the ores in Zimbabwe yeah. and they come to be smeltered here in South Africa. So I think they've been negotiating uh, uh, on that. But I think if you look in terms of recently, uh, you know, what has been at core is about the diamonds in, in, in Mutari. Yeah, and, and, and the Zimbabwe and the, the diamond story is notorious in yes. terms of the blood diamond stories con connected to the Mugabe government uh, and, and the, those are, are legion. But we look at the situation in which Zimbabwe finds itself. Clearly, there is frustration at a government level that South African companies, among them Tonga, Hewlett, PPC, Standard Bank and others, who are simply not ticking the boxes in Paola and Aquarius in there too. No, certainly, I think currently some of them are not taking their bosses. But I think what we are they hedging their bets? Are they betting that the Zimbabwe government simply can't enforce this indigenization? Well, they, they do enforce in some cases, but remember also Zimbabwean government is broke, really. Mm. Uh, so, so, so we're going into elections in 2018, um, and, and you know, then obviously trying to enforce about all these things. But we also have got a company called Telcel, uh, which is uh, in the telecommunications also that has been running into terms into problems, but that company is owned by Zimbabweans. So, so, so really, I think the key issue really here is for Zimbabwe to be able to attract foreign investment and also to attract investment investments by Zimbabweans outside and inside mm. Zimbabwe. They need to make sure that the, the, you know, the playing fields and all the laws are quite clear for everybody to, to be able to follow and implement. I mean, they claim to have had $545 million of uh, in foreign direct investment into Zimbabwe, which is a drop in the ocean. It isn't really a lot of money by Zimbabwean standards. It may be, but surely at some point that dries up unless you get the clarity, the legislative clarity that you require. Certainly, we don't know how much I should trigger it in, 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 in cash or most of it was promises. You remember some of these things, you know, governments will go and sign bilateral agreements overseas, mm -hmm. like currently the president is in Japan. So he is signing lots of deals, but whether those deals will go through is a, is, is a different story altogether. Uh, we have lots of Chinese companies that we're trying to do, um, you know, hydroelectric or power generation and so on. But most of those things, possibly the money didn't really follow. Those are some of the promises. As you know, that obviously Zimbabwe is struggling from a liquidity uh, perspective. And I don't think really investors are flowing in as they would want us to believe. Uh, let's say government puts a line in the sand and says, right, this far and no further, we will start revoking licenses. What is the consequence? The consequence is, is that basically you're going to end up only the government being the only employer. Okay. So, so certainly in terms of taxes collection, it will dry up because people, you know, there's no employment. Everybody is self-employed. But surely the government understands that. They do understand that, but the challenge here is that you still have businesses that are willing to do business with them knowingly, mm. okay, that, you know, some of those things not are above board. So you still have companies that were mining um, in, in the Chaswell Diamonds, uh, basically to obviously to the benefit of, of the ruling party. And that's where the challenge is. The challenge really is to say, how do businesses uh, comply, not only just comply with the government laws to say, are we doing the right mm. thing? That that is sustainable for the betterment of the nation in totality. In South Africa right now, the, po the popular term is state capture, and yes. the capture of the state, of business interests using politicians to get hold of state-owned assets. It, Zimbabwe got captured a long time ago, and until you undo the state capture, is there any way of restoring the Zimbabwean economy? Because one gets the sense as an outsider looking in that 
if you are connected to Zandu PF, you're in the money, you'll be okay, you can do the indigenization deals, um, and money will flow into the coffers of Zandu PF. Uh, if not, well, then you're an outsider, you're a rank outsider. hundred mm. percent. The tragedy of Africa, really, is when there is a compromise in some of those things. And secondly, when there's a collusion between the ruling elite and the business class. That has been the biggest challenge in Africa, where, where basically certain people or certain businesses, because of their allegiance to, to the ruling party, you know, they can do as they please. And, and the rest of the businesses obviously have to then scramble to do that. For me, I I think businesses need to be able to say from a corporate governance perspective, how do we apply them, uh, complying and making sure that obviously they still get business. Remember the debate here is that, so who is not uh, involved mm. or who does not want government as, um, um, uh, as, as a client? Now there's this issue about the Guptas, then we've got issues about the Rupes and so on. People making all sorts of accusations that you know uh, this family is not the only family that has captured uh, their set. The reasons that there's been too much gray area and second Secondly, that the government's uh, leaders basically have not taken a moral ground to be able to make sure that it's clear between mm. the policies and the governance in the public sector they follow and obviously the private uh, sector governance structures. Um, as of what we find itself right now, it's pushing ahead. It wants compliance with indigenization laws. It looks like many companies are digging in their heels and simply refusing. That could lead to a suspension of licenses. It could lead to another financial crisis in Zimbabwe. Certainly, they, they're not making any profits. So, so so if the conditions become so stringent, and secondly, you do not know where you're going. Remember, a couple of businesses also lost money during the, the hyperinflation, where mm -hmm. the Reserve Bank simply took people's money. Um, and one of the Chinese companies actually contested through Stan Chat, who was the banker. And the bank said, well, the money was taken by the central bank. So the government has come up to, the, the, to, to guarantee those issues. But it has never been quite clear who was the benefit, uh, the benef uh, you know, uh, the benefactor yeah. of, of those? Yeah. So where do we find Zimbabwe five years from now? Pretty much in the same position, I suspect, as it was now and five years ago. Well, f in five years' time, bef uh, up to right into the election, certainly there's going to be a problem. Um, you know, nothing is really moving forward. Well, we, know the, we know the outcome of the 2018 yeah. elections. Yes. <laughs> we, we know the outcome of those elections. Zanu PF wins. Robert Mugabe continues somehow, if, if he has to bring in a taxi to Well, it's not quite know. clear that in yeah. 2018 they win, actually. Um, our hope and view is that the young people are going to realize that, you know what, uh, we have possibly based on life expectancy, uh, more vested interest in making sure that we do the right thing, exercise our right to vote, and vote them out of, um, uh, out of power. They've been also fighting. There are also factions within ZANU PF, mm -hmm. just like in MDC. So, so our hope and uh, faith is that you know, in 2018, they won't vote uh, somebody who is 95 into, into another five years. Uh, well, the reason I like you so much, you're such an optimist, Joseph. There Thank you. <laughs> Thank Joseph you so Bucha, much. You're managing Director of J.M. Boucher Investments, joining us, of course, this evening on The Money Makers. Yeah, very complicated story is Zimbabwe. Of course, you think BE is complicated. Just look across our border at Zimbabwe. Indigenization and government there intent on pursuing the policy regardless of the consequences. More Money Makers tomorrow. Till then, thank you for watching. Good night.